Welcome to our Christmas Eve candlelight service. I'm Reverend Diana Davies and my pronouns are she, her, hers. There is something so bittersweet about being together in spirit, but not in body on this most sacred and magical of evenings. Each of us in our own homes, connecting not through touch, but through electrons and light similar in some regards to the way we might see the light of a star beamed across space and time. In the same way that the stars we see in the night sky may no longer exist or may not even be stars at all, but merely planets aligned, the story we tell on Christmas Eve may not be based in history or in actual events, but its light still shines. The story may be simply that, a story, and yet there is a deep truth to it. The truth that love can be found in the most unexpected of places. The truth that beauty is there waiting for us if we just look for it. The truth that sometimes, even when we don't know exactly what it is that we're looking for, it can find us. Peace love, and amazing, awe-inspiring beauty. They find us. And that is the very definition of grace. Tonight, we will tell the old story of Christmas through scripture, song, and readings adapted from a short work called The Birth, written by the author and theologian Frederick Beekner which recounts the nativity story from the perspective of three of its characters, the innkeeper, a simple shepherd, and the wise men. We'll end our service this evening as we do each year by singing Silent Night by Candlelight. We'll just be further apart than we usually are. At the end of the service, you're welcome to stay on for an informal virtual reception. There's no separate Zoom link, so just stay on and we'll break out into some small groups 
for holiday greetings and conversation. But first, we light our chalice. Our chalice lighter this evening is Lois Newton Edwards. On this cold evening near the end of an infamous year, we light our chalice to remind us that despite everything, hope lives on. Love lives on, like a flame that is passed on from one candle to another. Peace, hope, joy, and love are passed on from one life to another. We light our chalice to remember that even in the darkness, we are not lost. We are illuminated by the light of loving community. Thank you. And our opening hymn this evening is Bells in the High Tower. If you are singing along with us from home in the gray hymnal, it's number 56. It's an old Hungarian carol and it's performed this evening by Lana Henson and Warren Palmer. first reader this evening is Alyssa Lee. A reading from the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. 
all went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. This is the innkeeper's story, again as written by Frederick Beekner. Do you know what it is like to run an inn, to run a business, a family, to run anything in this world for that matter, even your own life? It is like being lost in a forest of a million trees and each tree is a thing to be done. Is there fresh linen on all the beds? Did the children put on their coats before they went out? Has the letter been written? The book read, is there money enough left in the bank? Today, we have food in our bellies and clothes on our backs, but what can we do to make sure that we will have them still tomorrow? A million trees, a million things, until finally we have eyes for nothing else and whatever we see turns into a thing. The sparrow lying in the dust at your feet, just a thing to be kicked out of the way, not the mystery of death. The children calling outside your window, just a distraction, an irrelevance, not life, not the wildest miracle of them all. That whispering in the air that comes sudden and soft from nowhere. It's just the wind, only the wind. Of course, I remember very well the evening they arrived. I was working on my accounts and I looked up just in time to see the woman coming through the door. She walked in that slow, heavy-footed way that women have in the last months, as though they are walking in a dream or at the bottom of the sea. Her husband stood a little behind her, a tongue-tied, helpless kind of man, I thought. I cannot remember either of them saying anything although I suppose some words must have passed, but at least it was mostly silence. The clumsy silence of the poor, you know what I mean. It was clear enough what they wanted. The stars had come out. I, I remember the stars perfectly, though I don't know why I should sitting inside as I was. I hadn't stood up, of course. There was mainly just silence. And then it happened much in the way that you have heard. I did not lie about there being no room left. There really was none. Though perhaps if there had been a room, I might have lied as much for their sakes as for the sake of the inn. Their kind would have felt more at home in a stable, that's all. And I don't mean that unkindly either, God knows. Later that night when the baby came, I wasn't there. I was lost in the forest somewhere, the unenchanted forest of a million trees. I wasn't around, I saw none of it. And as for what I heard, just at that moment itself of birth when a nobody turns into somebody, 
I don't rightly know what I heard, but this I do know, my own true love. All your life long, you wait for your own true love to come. We all of us do. Our destiny, our joy, our heart's desire. So how am I to say it? When he came, I missed him. Our next reader is Scott Harvey. These words are from the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 through 18. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace, goodwill among people. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known 
what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. This is the story of one of the shepherds. Night was coming on and it was cold and I was terribly hungry. I had finished all the bread I had in my sack and my gut still ached for more. And then as I noticed a friend, a shepherd like me, he was about to throw away a crust that he didn't want. So I said, throw it to me, friend. And he did throw it to me, but it landed between in the mud where the sheep had mucked it all up. But I grabbed it anyway, and, and I stuffed it mud and all into my mouth. And I thought, the bread is very good. And I thought, and the mud is good too. So I opened my muddy man's mouth full of bread and I yelled to my friends, by God, it's good brothers. And they thought I was a terrible fool, but they saw what I meant. We saw everything that night, everything. everything. Can I make you understand? I wonder. Have you ever had this happen to you? You've been working hard all day and you're dog tired, bone tired. So you call it quits for a while. You slump down under a tree or against a rock or something and you just sit there in a daze for an hour or a million years, I don't know. And all this time, your eyes are wide open, looking straight ahead someplace, but they're so tired and glassy that they don't see anything, nothing. You could be dead for all you notice. And then little by little, you begin to come to, and then your eyes begin to come to, and all of a sudden, you find out you've been looking at something the whole time, except it's, it's only now you really see it. One of the ewe lambs, maybe, with its foot caught under a rock, or the sun, scort the moon, <laughs> scorching a hole through the clouds. It was there all the time. You were looking at it all the time, but you just didn't see it until now. That's how it was that night anyway, like finally coming to not things coming out of nowhere that had never been there before, but things just coming into focus that had always been there. And such things. The air wasn't just emptiness anymore. It, it was alive. Brightness everywhere dipping and wheeling like a flock of birds. And, and what you always thought was silence stopped being silent and turned into the beating of wings. Thousands and thousands of them. Only not just wings as you came to war, but voices, voices, high, wild, like trumpets. The words I could never remember later, but something like what I'd yelled with my mouth full of bread. By God, it's good, brothers. The crust, the mud, everything, everything. 
the eye of the storm, you know, there's no wind. Nothing moves. Nothing breathes. Even silence keeps silent. So hush now. Hush. There he is. You see him? You see him? Open your eyes. Listen. Angels, we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Go And Mary and Todd, it'll do our call to offering this evening. Every Sunday, we take an offering. All the cash and designated checks from that offering go directly to external nonprofit organizations doing good work in our community, our Change for Change partners. It's a tradition, however, that the Christmas Eve offering is set aside for the minister's discretionary fund. This fund is used to, to support members and friends of the congregation, as well as members of our larger community who are experiencing a financial emergency. Money is distributed by the minister on a completely confidential basis and there is no expectation of repayment. In the past, this funding has been used to assist in paying for temporary housing, covering rent, making repairs to a home or car, purchasing gas or groceries, or assisting with medical expenses not covered by insurance. Between the pandemic, local job losses, and our October ice storm, there has been an elevated need for this kind of support in the past year, and it seems likely that this situation will continue into 2021. So please give as generously as you can. While we listen to the offertory, you may wish to make a donation using a credit card through our website. Or, you, or this could be a good time to find your checkbook write out a check and put it aside 
to mail to First Unitarian tomorrow morning. Let this evening's offering reflect our highest aspirations for the work of this church in the world and in our own community. And as I move to the offertory, which is what child is this or green sleeves performed by Wendy Pitt. I just want to note that we heard earlier this evening, our website is down. Uh, we are looking into correcting that. Um, and you may not want to mail that check tomorrow morning since it's Christmas day. So <laughs> hold off a day and then please then do uh, give generously to the minister's discretionary fund. Reverend Diana, the website is now back up. Ah. I just heard the website is now back up. Next reader is Jean Hunt. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. She gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in, in bands of cloth and laid him in the manger because there was no place for them in the end. Thank you, Jean. And from the book of Matthew, chapter two, verses one through two. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, 
Astrologers from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. This is the story of the wise men, again as told by Frederick Buechner. Beware of beautiful strangers, and on Friday, avoid travel by water. The sun is moving into the house of Venus, so affairs of the heart will prosper. We said this to Herod or something along those lines. And of course, it meant next to nothing. To have told him anything of real value, we would have had to spend weeks of study, months, calculating the conjunction of the planets at the precise moment of his birth and the births of his parents and their parents back to the fourth generation. But Herod knew nothing of this. And he jumped at the nonsense we threw him like a hungry dog and he thanked us for it. Why did we travel so far to be there when it happened? Why was it not enough just to know the secret without having to be there ourselves to behold it? To this, not even the stars have an answer. The stars said simply that he would be born. It was another voice altogether that said to go. A voice as deep within ourselves as the stars are deep within the sky. But why did we go? I couldn't tell you now, and I couldn't have told you then, not even as we were in the very process of going, not that we had no motive, but that we had so many. Curiosity, I suppose. To be wise is to be eternally curious, and we were very wise. We wanted to see for ourselves this one before whom even the stars are said to bow down, to see perhaps if it was really true, because even the wise have their doubts and longing. Longing. Why will a person who is dying of thirst crawl miles across sands as hot as fire at simply the possibility of water. But if we long to receive, we long to also to give. Why will a person labor and struggle all the days of their life so that in the end they have something to give to the one they love? So finally, we got to the place where the star pointed us. It was at night, very cold. The innkeeper shows that, showed us the way that we did not need to be shown. The odor of the hay was sweet and the cattle's breath came out in little puffs of mist. The man and the woman, between them, the king. We didn't stay long, only a few minutes as the clock goes. 10,000 years. We set our foolish gifts down on the straw and we left.
Please join me in a spirit of prayer or meditation. This was written by Anglican writer Tess Ward, and it's from her book, The Celtic Wheel of the Year. A Midwinter Prayer. From the rising of the midwinter sun to its setting, scatter the darkness with the light of your love, O shining one. Make me short on mean thoughts, long on offering words of comfort. Make me short on being driven, long on paying attention. Make me short on focusing only on my own, long on looking beyond. Make me short on obsessive lists, long on spontaneous acts of kindness. Make me short on mindless activity, long on time to reflect. Make me short on tradition as a habit, long on rediscovery and re-owning. Make me short on rushing and tiring, long on pausing and wondering. Make me short on false festive jollity, long on still and rooted joy. Make me short on guilt, long on being merciful to myself. Make me short on being overwhelmed, long on peaceableness as I set forth. This day. And now in the silence, may we hear and honor the deepest prayers of our hearts. May it be so. Amen. And at this point, I invite you to go get a candle. If you're on a smartphone or a tablet, you might even be able to go outside. I don't know. We're just gonna turn down the lights here. Once you get your candle, go ahead and hold it up. And this evening, we have some very special song leaders for Silent Night. This is Thayer and Meredith Dykus. 
And very often when we sing Silent Night, we'll sing it in English and then in German. We have a special treat tonight. We'll hear it in English and in French because all languages are sacred. Please join us in singing Silent Night. offer these words of wisdom from Reverend Howard Thurman. When the song of angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace, to make music in the heart. And Lois, would you extinguish our chalice for us? Oops, you're muted. Well, you know the words, everyone. They're the same ones we say every Sunday. We extinguish this chalice, but not the... There you are. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> but not the light of love and community, which continue to burn in our hearts. And I invite you to just stay here with your candles for just a little bit longer. I'm going to play some music in the background, and we can just imagine that we're outside in the courtyard seeing each other's faces in the flickering candlelight. And when the music is over and we blow out our candles again, if you need to go, we'll see you on Sunday. And otherwise, please stay um, in the same Zoom space and we'll have a little informal sort of a, a cookie reception with bring your own cookies at the end.
Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas, everyone. And I'm going to turn my lights on. And again, you're welcome to stay for a little bit longer and just greet and chat each other. I'll be right back. 